Hello, everyone. So um, this, I am Jenna. This is episode 47 of Sake. Today we have Carrie Hill, um, and she's going to be showing us a bit of her work um, at Chill Baskets. Um, she'll probably show us a little bit of her creation, talk about her process, and all of that really cool stuff. Um, but first, I just wanted to let you know what Art for Art's Sake is, if this is your first time joining us. Um, so art for art's sake is an entirely online way of staying immersed in the arts while social distancing. Each day we try to focus a local artist from St. Lawrence County or surrounding areas to talk about or demonstrate their craft and their art. So if you are interested in being a part of this lovely program that we've created, um, please email me at programs at slcartscouncil.org and we can get you added to the schedule. Um, also, I'd like to remind you Guys, if you guys are um, interested, there is going to be um, a member show coming up and our deadline for submission is tomorrow. So um, if you're interested in doing that, definitely after this uh, live stream, go ahead and um, submit your application. I have the member show application link in the description of this live stream. So you can just go check that out. Um, the only requirement that we ask that you are a member of the St. Lawrence County Council for um, admission fees. So if you uh, are already a member or would like to join, you can um, sign up for our member show. Um, so we'd love to have you do that as well. Um, but without further ado, I'll just uh, introduce you to Kay Hill. So you can take it off mute. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, Tell us a bit about uh, what it is you do and uh, how you got started doing this like whole, I guess, art craft. So, that you do. My name is Carrie Hill, and I am the sole owner and proprietor of Chill Baskets. Um, what I do is I go around and I demonstrate different techniques of weaving, or I teach um, small projects to children. Like next week, I'll be teaching online because of COVID it has to be online um, bookmarks so these kits will be sent out um, to community members and I'll show them how to how to weave and everything with that and they'll be learning with the materials that I use which is black ash and sweet grass and um, I participate in art markets I do a lot of teaching in the, the local elementary schools the middle schools the high schools and I've taught at colleges um, I go around and just try to try to um, give people information as much as they need and try to be as helpful as I can with basketry. Mm -hmm. So how did uh, you get started with this uh, business idea and with all of this, uh, I guess, like what sparked your interest in doing this? So when my youngest daughter was a baby, she's 13 now, um, I had the option of being a stay at home mom. And I did realize that it's such a, it's, it's a hard thing to be a stay at home mom, right? Like it's such a big decision. My first daughter, I went to work as soon as I can and I missed a lot of her first. And then when I had my youngest daughter, it was, it was time to just hang out with my babe. But then after about four months, it was like, she was the only person I was interacting with because I didn't have a job outside the home and I didn't work with other people. I saw my husband when he came home and my oldest daughter come home and stuff like that. But then me and the baby were just home chilling all day. And I wanted something for me, you know, something more than diapers and dishes and things like that and dinner, you know? So I just wanted something for me. And I knew watching, hanging out with my aunts growing up that um, they had this skill of making baskets and stuff. So I really got along with my auntie, Laura. I nicknamed her my auntie little one because she's like four foot 11. <laughs> she's real cute, pocket size and fierce. I love it so much. And I asked her if she would teach me and she's like, yeah, come on down. So I go to her house and she would show me how to use the materials and how to like lay out the pieces and how to start the weave process and things like that. And then she would kind of encourage me to keep going. And I picked up the weave real easy. And all of a sudden it was like I had a basket and uh, she was really impressed. It was tight. My curls were uniform and she said I did a good job. And with that encouragement, it was just like, hey, I want to make another one. 
and then I want to make another one. And then it got to the point to where she was showing me how to prepare my own materials because you don't just walk up to a black ash tree and shake it and it just falls, right? Like there's a lot of steps and stages that go into getting the material ready to work with. And so she showed me how to prepare the materials to be usable. And it was a lot of work, but I just fell in love with it. Like I've been a tomboy my whole life, so I've never been afraid to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know firsthand that it gets addicting because I remember I took a class with you last summer and even I was like wanting to do it over and over and over again afterward. Um, I haven't since, but it definitely Aww. would be something I was interested in. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So what, I know that you make things that are, are beyond baskets, like thing that you focus um, I can you, know, you make earrings and that. So what kind of other stuff? Uh, and when did you start, you know, veering away from, not veering away from, I guess, but like adding to your um, different objects that you're making, yeah. Um, I think once I started getting the hang of using the actual techniques, like there's different twists and curls that we have, like, um, like this is a bell. It's not typically traditional or anything, but it has the points on it and they're, they're typically called like porcupine or pineapple curls. And so you can see how they're shaped. And that's, that's kind of how they're named. So that's a example of a pineapple or porcupine curl. Uh, we also have standing shell curls, like on this miniature, you see the little round circles. Those are standing shell curls. And I think I started experimenting more once I became more confident in my ability to be able to masterfully put those curls on something and embellish it a little bit better. And then, I mean, creation, to me, creation is like medicine, right? Like, um, especially with the, the monotonous movement of weaving, it's very, it's, it's, it's calming and it, it just kind of puts you in a chill mood. And it, it's like, I really like it. And I mean, you're working with black ash and sweet grass, like, I don't know what smells better than sweet grass. So there's that, you know, and, but and as far as experimenting, I mean, I kind of always used to experiment. I would ask my auntie, like, auntie, can I do this? And she'd be like, mm, try it. So I was like, all right. So I would try my experiment and I would show her and she'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, very nice. And then I'd, I'd find something else and then it would be like, auntie, can I do this? And she'd be like, mm, try it. So I try it. So like, she never really said you should push boundaries or anything, but she never restricted me either. I was like, oh, you can't do that. We never did that. You know what I mean? Like, it was cool that she just let me explore and create whatever I kind of wanted to. So that, that was really nice. So my first experiments were with colors and then with combining the different curls. And then my first, first experiment with things that were non-traditional, such as earrings. Um, I had a friend that had purchased a pair of uh, beaded sweetgrass earrings for me at a powwow. And it said that she said that they reminded her of me and they were sitting on my table. And at this point I hadn't gotten a studio yet. And I was looking at my scraps on the table and I was looking at the earring and I was just like, oh my God, let me just try this, right? Like, let me just check it out. And so I made them and it was very similar to these and I'll just hold it up. It was similar to that. And I didn't think it was gonna get such a big response, but it did. And it ended up, I think I, I made my first five pairs and within half an hour, they were just gone. And then I kind of knew I was onto something because who doesn't like to wear pretty things, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, I have a pair, but I love them. So, uh, so awesome. Um, <laughs> and I know, I know people um, were mentioning because I did show some people that they were interested in me. But uh, do you happen to know? I personally don't know myself actually, but like the origin of where like this even started within the culture. Um, like basket making and like what like I guess inspired them to use like this kind of material to put these together so from my understanding um and I'm not a historian and I, I could be wrong but it's just like from what I've heard word of mouth from person to person is that 
we've always lived off the land, right? So we always had utility baskets that we wore on our back to carry things, the pack baskets. Um, we had utility baskets with the wedding baskets, which are strong and sturdy square or rectangle that they exchanged during weddings. So there were baskets that were made for ceremony and things of that nature. But I believe the fancy baskets came about with the European trade. Um, that's when things started to get more embellished and more pretty because you're trying to have items to trade for other things, you know what I mean? So I think that's that's about when they started experimenting with the different techniques and stuff. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, I've always wondered that myself even because <laughs> right, like I'm not even hundred percent the reservation. Right, like I'm I'm not oh, I'm not a hundred percent on that, but that's that's what I was told. So I'd hate to give misinformation, but that that's what I was told. Yeah, for sure. Um, so for yourself, what do you think is the most like enjoyable aspect about what you do? Because I know you teach classes as well as, you know, make your own products and that kind of thing. So uh, what do you enjoy most about it? Um, so when I teach, what I really enjoy is watching my students have that light bulb moment that like, <gasps> okay, it makes sense now, you know, and they can kind of like envision how they're going to do it. And you can already tell by what they're doing that they're thinking about their next project. You know what I mean? So like, that's one of my favorite things. Another favorite is uh, preparing the materials. Like I mentioned before, um, a lot of people tend to step away from the hard work because there's nothing glamorous about peeling splint or picking sweet grass. It's hard work. I'm coming up on um, July real quick, right? Like tomorrow's July. So pretty soon it'll be time to go and harvest the sweet grass in the field, which is, excuse me, like really a labor of love because you're in the middle of a field with the hot sun beating down on you. There's no air in the field and you're bending down and standing up and you're picking and, and it's, you're surrounded by snakes and spiders and bogs and the sweat and, you know, like you just, yeah, you gotta love what you're doing if you're going to be doing that. You know what I mean? So that's another favorite thing. And uh, I just love experimenting and, and trying to push the boundaries and not be stuck in a cookie cutter. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so we, um, who asked, do you have a favorite medium to work with? Um, black ash and sweet grass, definitely, definitely. Um, I did actually team up with one of my friends though not too long ago, and we, she, so she does what's called science jewelry. I guess is like the cool way of how we, oh, not the cool way, but it's how she explained it to me. And what it is is it's electroforming, and she was experimenting with natural materials, like just to see what it was. So we created a piece together. And I'll show you that. And this is the science jewelry that we came up with. And so what she did was I made the disc and then she applied the paint that would allow the copper to form to the wood. And now it's like, it's hard, you can hear it, right? So it's, it's like indestructible. Wow, okay. <laughs> it's indestructible at the copper part. The wooden part, however, is probably not indestructible at all. But so we, we tried experimenting with that. And then we, I, a couple years ago, I was asked to create a piece for Native Max magazine for a friend who does Babes Cosmetics. And they were trying to show off her jewelry, her, excuse me, her makeup um, products. And she asked if we would create a piece. So Toby Mitchell, she's my chief. Um, she did the beadwork and I did the, the weaving for this. And I don't know if you can kind of see like the gold leaf on the, the circle, circle curls, the popcorn curls. So we created this piece and it was, it was in a, uh, a magazine. So that's kind of cool. And that's part of my, my private collection. And right now I'm currently working on a mask. I'm going to be going out to um, Blue Mountain Lake in a couple of days to deliver a mask similar to this one. Um, and so I don't know if that was fast enough for, for good luck, but that mask was created um, as, as almost like a, like a tongue in cheek response. I got tagged in a post about them at the beginning of COVID because somebody had done one with a cedar mask 
um, with cedar bark material and they wove it and they turned it into a mask. And then I was um, tagged and I was like, you know, I don't really want to. And then my friend's son tagged me and I was just in a, like a spunky little mood. And I was like, you know what, fine, I'm going to make it and I'm going to get it to you by Friday then. <laughs> so I worked on the mask for about three days and I was done and I was just blown away. Like it was really cool. And a lot of times when I'm working, if I, ha if I'm making something that I want to make, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll put it together and I don't see it until it's done. And then when I'm done with it, it's like, oh, I made that. Huh. Like, I just, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, I know it sounds stupid. Like I should probably know what I'm doing, but it's never really like that. If I'm just having that creative freedom to do whatever I want, it just, I don't know. It's like, I'm going through the motions and there it is. And it's like, wow, that's, that's really cool. <laughs> I don't know. It's fun though. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. I feel like that's a like a lot of just like do it. So it's really good to just do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you are you having trouble hearing me as well? <laughs> a little bit. Like you're okay, getting. I'm, I'm hoping the viewers have uh are having uh and I hope the viewers aren't having issues. I was just wondering that um as we were going along because there were parts where you cut out as well. Oh no. So if anyone in the comments would like to let me know if you guys are able to hear us, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'll just, um, no one's asked any other questions, but um, I have a question about your future plans. Do you have anything in like the works that uh, is different to like something that you've done already or are you just kind of like vibing with whatever comes to you? So, so with COVID, right, everything is different. Um, it took away my travel ability. It took away my in-person teaching ability for the time being. So my slate got cleared for the first time in five years. I don't have any plans, but I do have a bunch of different ideas that I would like to work on. I want to work on making woven patches for jean jackets and things. Like I have one in the studio right now that says land back on it and it's, it's not finished, but I'm working on it. And then I'm also working on um, different um, like accessory elements to an, an outfit. Um, I, I may be working on a hat but I'm leaning closely towards a fedora but when I figure that one out I'll start that but like there's always something that I want to do you know what I mean like even when I'm working on a commission and I have specific things I have to follow in the back of my brain I'll have ideas going on and I'll, I'll have things I have to write down real quick so that I don't forget to work on that or different color combinations or things so I like to keep it open a little bit but I do like some of the structure of having a plan you know what I mean so that it, it doesn't because if I'm left to my own devices I'm worse than a little kid really I get like squirrel syndrome oh my god I'm distracted by that over here and you know so it's good to have focus so it's good to have some sort of a plan but I'm I don't have a whole bunch of them so um I'm, I know the only thing I have coming up right now is my class next week with the tribe on June, July 8th, I think. And we're doing bookmarks, but other than that, like everything got canceled. My summer classes got canceled, my demonstrations, everything, everything. And, and I hesitate to even complain because everybody's going through some kind of loss right now, you know? So I don't wanna really get into that a whole lot. Yeah, definitely. We're all feeling the um, downfall of having everything canceled around us. That's why we have this thing. We have this, <laughs> <laughs> this to keep it alive, right? <laughs> or at least the best we can. Um, right. So do you have like any for someone who want to start doing like or similar to it um, on well, like maybe a free get started? Uh, what would you say? I would say, um, don't be afraid to just try it. You know what I mean? Like if you have a little bit of an interest, you might, you might find that you have a lot of interest in, the, in it. And then you might find you have no interest. You should never be afraid to experiment in a healthy way. <laughs> um, just, just try it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, I don't know. I, I just think that you should just try it. Like the scariest thing I ever did was walk away from study money to pursue my love of art full time. Um, I don't need 
steak every night for dinner, but bologna still meat. You know what I mean? And even on the days when I can't afford bologna, there's peanut butter and jelly. So there's something, but you know, you, you kind of, it depends how hungry you are too. You know what I mean? But um, don't sell yourself short either and always kind of stay true to who you are and on your path and don't let somebody else's vision of what you should or shouldn't be dictate your life. You know what I mean? Like I have always, and you can tell, you know, I'm covered in tats and piercing, you know, whatever, but I just, just don't be afraid to be who you are because um, you don't want to be a cookie cutter, you know, and, and if you don't want to be that cookie cutter, don't do cookie cutter things. Does that make sense? Like, just don't be afraid though, to take that, that, you know, you can fail, but you could also not, you know, like, it could end up being the most amazing thing that ever happened, or it could just be a lesson. It just depends on how you approach it, I think. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I feel like I've, I've, not, I've obviously known you for a long time. So I feel like that's kind of the types of things you've told me throughout the years. But um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to open the floor to questions from our viewers, but in the meantime, while they're, you know, thinking about it, um, where can we find your work and stuff like that? So I just got a website. It's uh, www.chill-baskets.com. Um, also, if you're going to start a business, maybe run your own website. That would be super helpful. I'm learning because when I could have renewed my website, it would have cost me $1,400. I mean, $14 and now it's $2,500 to renew it because somebody else bought my domain. So also stay on top of that. <laughs> if you're planning on doing a business of some sort, it helps to have a class or a class in business. For me, I didn't actually start baskets as um, a career. I started baskets as something to do when my baby was in bed at night and it just kind of happened upon me. You know, it, um, the business happened to me faster than I I did it. It happened super organic and fast. So I'm finding there's things that I need to learn about really as far as running a business. And I have time now to learn, right? <laughs> I'm grounded. So, yeah. For sure. And um, we have all the links to the links you provided in the description as well. So anyone who's um, wanting to look at your work afterward can go click on those. Um, real easy, simple. Um, so anything else you want to add? Um, I'm not sure. There's like so many different avenues you could go with the conversation. You know what I mean? I just think that um, from an artist's perspective, though, don't be afraid to experiment or try things. Don't be afraid to step out of the box. Um, don't be afraid to support your artisans. <laughs> We're not all trying to get rich off your back. You know what I mean? Like some of us just want to eat. That's all. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so we did get a question. Um, and it is, do you have any advice for introducing more creativity and art to little kids? Oh, very good. Um, if you're going to introduce creativity and art to little kids, I would advise you to start with something fast and small, and that would provide instant gratification. So when I teach little kids, I like to um, give them the material, let them touch it, show them the finished product first, what they're gonna start with. So like, I would be like, this is what we're making. And then I would alter it in a way that they could understand it. So you never, you always wanna keep their, their age um mentality in mind when you are teaching children because not all children you know the age groups vary so hard a five-year-old and a seven-year-old might not have the same understanding so you have to alter how you teach them or introduce things based on their their age appropriateness would be would be the way like just try to be as age appropriate as you can and keep it interesting because they're they're like me they have like that squirrel syndrome where you have to keep their attention or you lose them you know Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I think that's really, I think it's good to introduce that kind of stuff young, um, because then you're at least putting, like getting their foot in the door and allowing mm -hmm. them to experiment with a new craft. Because um, some people might never, never even have the opportunity otherwise than if you were like in a class as, as a child. 
Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming on. If anyone has any other questions, um, I can ask them really quickly, but um, I'll just close it for now. Um, so if you guys are interested in doing art for art's sake, um, like I said at the beginning of this video, you can email me at programs at slcartscouncil.org um, or message us on Facebook and we'll get you scheduled in so that we can do a really cool interview like this. Um, we love to have multiple artists from any different arts craft on here. So um, definitely reach out to um, Once again, remember show deadline is tomorrow. So if you want to um, get involved with that, check out the link in this description so that you can submit um, your application for that. Um, but otherwise, th uh, thanks, Carrie, for uh, showing us your work and discussing and taking time of your day to come on this awesome uh, platform. <laughs> Aw, well, y'all for having me. Thanks for thinking of me to do this. I appreciate the, the uh, opportunity to show my work. Yeah, of course. We're so glad to have you as well. And to the rest of you guys, I hope you guys have a great um, end to your June. <laughs> and yeah. we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> at the same time. So bye.